Like I mentioned before, as much as I ended up loving Sonic CD, it still had some pretty tough competition to become my new favorite game in Sonic's classic lineup. And when I mentioned that, I'm sure most of you knew which game or games I was talking about. This one certainly is an interesting case. No time travel, no pinball mechanics, no graphical remasking of a Japanese puzzle game. Oh wait, we still haven't done Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. I mean, it's Puyo Puyo on the Genesis. I don't know, man, I'll get to it later. But yeah, we were back to the basics here. Just speedy platforming with your favorite blue blur and his best friend, but don't take that to mean the game was without ambition. If anything, this was meant to be the biggest and most captivating game the series had seen up to this point, but due to, once again, a rushed development, this ended up getting split into two parts. Development of Sonic 3 was taking longer than expected, and while Sega was willing to take more time to get things ready to roll, they had to deal with McDonald's to release a line of toys coinciding with the release of the game, and good old Ronnie Boy is not the patient type, so the team had to get creative. The solution was unique, that's for sure. Sonic 3 was cut off at roughly the halfway point and released as a standalone game with some changes made here or there to make it feel like a complete experience, you know, more or less, and work continued on the rest of the adventure, which would release later that same year in the form of Sonic and Knuckles. This wasn't your standard cartridge either. This was the introduction, and only use of, something Sega called lock-on technology. Now, this cartridge in and of itself was its own game, about on the same level of length and quality as Sonic 3 and helped bring the ongoing story to a sort of conclusion, but this piece of plastic the game was stored in had some tricks up its sleeve. Flip open the top of Sonic and & Knuckles and plug either Sonic 2 or Sonic 3 in to unlock a new experience. We'll touch on the cartridge's compatibility with Sonic 2 later in this review, but its primary function was to bridge the gaps between Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, making it one single flowing adventure as it was always intended to be, and that's why we're reviewing these games together. They were always meant to be one journey. The gameplay was back to the classic formula, but it had a lot more bells and whistles to show off now. This is where the story started demanding a lot more attention, and this was the introduction of a brand new rival for Sonic. Spoilers ahead, this is Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Before we get to anything else, it's important to discuss this game and its wavering availability. There was a time when you could see this game made available alongside the first and second games, like on Mega Collection Plus, even if getting access to the lock-on versions was kinda stupid. You essentially had to play each game a certain number of times to get Sonic 3 and Knuckles together, or do what I did and open and close each game repeatedly. It's really just more tedious than it needs to be. The title also found its way on several other systems, like the Wii's Virtual Console, I believe on the PSP, and the DS, through the Sonic Classic Collection, though this version does make the special stage a bit of an eyesore. I mean, everything else runs just fine, but these special stages... Oh, woof. But today, not so easy. You'll see Sonic 1 and 2 on the Switch, but the third entry is missing. Think it would be on the Xbox Arcade? Well, the listing is there, but you can't actually buy 3 or Sonic & Knuckles anymore. Not available on PS3 or PS Now, no Christian Whitehead port for mobile. The only place you can still find this game available for purchase is on Steam through the Genesis Collection for about five bucks. Oh, what's that? Sega's delisting that version too for the sake of making the Origins Collection more valuable, and this was announced while I was in the middle of working on this video and it's part of the reason why it's taken so long to put together? <laughs> I hate this industry. So why the scarcity of this game in particular? Well, it used to be a rumor, but it seems all but confirmed now that Michael Jackson had something to do with composing the music for these games and in recent years, Sega has been stuck in some legal trouble with his estate. Now that's as far as I'm going down that road. I have no evidence to present you with when it comes to Michael Jackson, his involvement with this game, the truth behind any of the allegations posed towards him around the time this game was being developed. For the purposes of this video, it's really just a possible reason as to why this game is so hard to find now. Sonic 3 & Knuckles is going to be present in the upcoming Sonic Origins collection, but I feel like I need to tackle that version separately, as while it will mostly be the same game you've always had the chance to experience, the business practices surrounding its release leads way to a whole new discussion you and I just just aren't ready for it yet. Oh, we'll get to it, just not today. That said, no matter what the Origins versions of those classics looks like, their port of Sonic 3 & Knuckles will already have some fierce competition in my eyes, as while I was working on this very video, I discovered what is, hands down, the best way to play one of Sonic's most ambitious outings. 
never underestimate the power of fan support. What we have here is my new favorite way to play this game and probably one of the easiest versions of it that I can recommend. I did still play through these titles on their original hardware so I could gather thoughts on them, and I will point out the differences where I can, but for the most part today, we are going to be talking about and showing off the ROM hack known as Angel Island Revisited. This project, which I'll be calling Sonic 3 Air for short, as far as I'm concerned, is on the same level, if not exceeding in some ways, as the Christian Whitehead ports of previous titles. Widescreen, controller support through Steam, all kinds of extra little bells and whistles, and the reason I don't mind using this version to review the game is because it's still incredibly faithful to the original, to the point where just about every structural, graphical, or mechanical change can be altered to your liking. So, if you want to experience Sonic 3 and Knuckles in as close to authentic a way as possible, but with a wider field of view, that option is open to you. But man, some of the other features here, like being able to use some of the unused tracks from the game's earlier days, choosing what music plays in what areas because some tracks are scrapped when the games are combined, adding in some encounters that were taken out, and that's not even mentioning some of the visual options. What do you mean you can change the speed up animation to the super peel out? Yes, please! And all you have to do is download the project and dump the ROM into the project folder. Now, what's frustrating is that, yeah, Sega is delisting their Steam version of the standalone game, which supplied you with the uncompressed ROM file that you could use to boot up Sonic 3 Air, which means the only official and legal means of accessing this project will no longer be available to fans who haven't already bought the Genesis Collection version of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Before this announcement was made, I had a version of this script where I commended Sega for going against the grain and making it possible to easily purchase the ROM and use it for fan projects like this, and now that compliment is gone, simply because it'll make Sonic Origins look better and I have a ton of other issues with how that collection is being handled. For shame, guys. I get that business is business and all that, and maybe the Origins collection on PC will let you access the ROM files like you could with buying the game standalone. I mean, the original versions of the games will be playable in Origins, but I seriously doubt that will be the case, and it just bites. I could go on, but again, there will be time for all this later, and I'll share my full thoughts on the whole Origins situation in the eventual Sonic Origins video. For now, let's just celebrate something good. I know it's a fan ROM hack, and I apologize if you think that takes away from my critique of this title, but again, I am going to be pointing out where the versions diverge where I can. You know, part of the reason it took me so long to get this video made is because I love it and it is incredible and I want it to be as thorough as possible, and I can't even tell you how many times I played through every single version of this game just over the past couple of weeks, but that's enough chatter about what version we're playing and actually jump into the title proper. After Sonic defeated Robotnik in the Death Egg at the end of Sonic 2, the massive space station fell from the stars down to an unfamiliar territory, a landmass floating above the clouds over the ocean known as Angel Island. Sonic is eager to hand the Mad Doctor a cease and desist on behalf of Lucasfilm, so he and Tails travel out to the crash site and, oh, Super Sonic. So I guess the Super Sonic ending is the canon version of Sonic 2, which is just kind of a shame in and of itself. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, in all seriousness, this had to have either been a really great callback for kids who actually put in the effort to get access to this form back in the last game, or something of a tease for players who might not have known it existed. Either way, it's actually really cool to see it acknowledged right here in the intro, and trust me, the supersonic form is only going to become more important later on. Now that said, it is going to make this a pretty easy mission though, huh? Hey you! I guess it wasn't enough to deal with Robotnik, now we've got to deal with his new buddy, a red echidna with cool dreads, thick gloves, a bad attitude, and now all seven of the Chaos Emeralds after smacking them out of Sonic and taking off with a chuckle. Take note, you take note of that right now because I swear he's gonna deny it later. Now the chase begins, right here on Angel Island. Find Eggman, stop him from repairing the Death Egg, and track down this new mysterious adversary. So you can clearly see that the traditional Sonic playstyle is back here. Running, jumping, the spin dash, loops to run through, but man, the energy it's given is unreal. Angel Island is already one of the most lively and vivid areas we've seen in the series so far, and man, the music is just real good. With just a small bit of exploring in this beginning portion, we see a couple of new additions to this formula as well. Shields are back, but now you can find elemental shields with new properties and abilities. The lightning shield, which will draw in nearby rings to Sonic, as well as allow him to double jump in the air and reach higher ground. The flame shield, which will make you impervious to fire damage, 
damage and even let you burst forward in the air in a flame charge attack. And finally, the water shield, which will allow you to plummet down to the ground faster and bounce a bit, but also give you an infinite amount of air to breathe while underwater. Each of these shields can be played around with throughout each stage and allow the player to utilize their special abilities to their benefit. And the experimentation that comes with this is rewarding, especially since these shields are often given to the player after treading off the beaten path to discover what secrets might be hiding in each area. Now, if that wasn't enough for you, Sonic has a new way to protect himself with the use of the Insta Shield. By pressing the jump button twice, you can let out a burst of energy around Sonic that can both protect him from damage and deal damage to nearby enemies. And this might seem like a small thing, but you'll want to get the hang of this move. This can be really useful for saving yourself from enemies you didn't see coming and when you need just a bit of an extension to Sonic's hitbox when tackling bosses. Speaking of which, after just a bit of exploring, uh, hey, what, what's this thing doing here? About four years after this game was released, uh, 1998, we saw a game called Half-Life hit store shelves. Now just stay with me here. The game has been recognized for years as one of the quintessential shooters. It was a landmark title on consoles, sure, but it really revolutionized PC play, and one aspect people were really taken by in Half-Life was how it dished out its story. You didn't see big, elaborate cutscenes in this title. Even when things were pre-scripted and on rails, you were still in the driver's seat and oftentimes able to interact with the world as these events played out. No longer were these things happening to just the characters in the narrative, they were happening to you, the player. Sonic 3 and Knuckles did that too, but in the 16-bit format. Sure, there are some sequences here that are a bit more hands-off, but while this game does introduce far more active story elements than the other games in the series that came before, it always felt like these moments were occurring organically in the locations themselves, adding to that immersion that the player was directly involved with what was happening on screen. In this moment here, you see this badnik just roll in and set the entire area you're in a blaze. This was unlike anything the previous games had attempted up to this point. You weren't time traveling to see a future where Eggman had won, no, you were just witnessing his destructive power alter the course of the entire rest of the stage, but that's not all. You do catch up to this particular machine, and he is the first of many mini-bosses you'll encounter in this game, with one waiting at the tail end of Act 1 of every zone. He's not particularly tough, most of these guys won't be, but after defeating him, you don't go flying off into the next act. A signpost will fall from the sky, and depending on where you make it land, it might even uncover some goodies. The post lands, your score is tallied up, Sonic and Tails pose, and then the next act just starts in a seamless transition, usually with an updated version of the track you were already listening to, and man, that's already on top of just the gorgeous way this level is laid out. The mountains and waterfalls connect perfectly within the foreground. I mean, this is the most real and organic one of these zones has felt up to this point. It feels like a real area. The amount of life here only makes the opening of this game feel more immersive as we see the real time effects of Dr. Robotnik arriving in an invading force. I mean, just look at this. The giant ship flying in to try to bomb the hedgehog, Eggman flying in from behind the trees. Sega was showing off in this area and in a big way. And of course, he's generally going to be the Act 2 boss encounter. He's not too much of a pushover in most of these fights either. He's not super hard to take on, but you've got to actually think about some of these encounters, and they do a great job of utilizing the environment from the given stage, incorporating that into the fight. It helps showcase that while he does make a lot of questionable choices, Robotnik is still a genius, and one of his greatest assets is adaptability. But once you beat Eggman for the first time and start making your way to the next area, who else but your new pal Knuckles is there to greet you, sending you spiraling down into Zone 2. Waterworld, starring Kevin Costner. Eh, don't worry, we're not really gonna be spending that much time on every zone. Angel Island just introduces a lot of stuff here, and it's one of the best opening levels in the series. Hydroplaning Zone is an interesting case, too, as they decide to start throwing more water mechanics at you right out the gate when it was already one of the more contentious elements from previous games, but man, do they have a lot of fun with it this go-around, constantly messing with water flows, currents, and slides to use the water theme and actually make it work for speedy gameplay. The sensation of zipping across the surface of water, that's one of the best ways you can communicate speed and it never fails to impress me. But even the moments that might seem entirely on rails are still relying on your inputs. The way you manipulate momentum to your advantage is still a key part of the gameplay and the zones in this title are good at taking advantage of this. I would say Marble Garden Zone and Carnival Night Zone are kind of the low points for me, though that mostly goes to Marble Garden. I think the whole thing just crawls a bit and the pacing feels kind of off. Still, if you've got a good nose for secrets, that'll really 
really pay off here, but more on that later. The spinning top gimmick is fun enough, but it can be a little hard to control, and this place really overuses spikes. It does have one of my favorite Robotnik fights, though. It's so great using Sonic and Tails together like this to fight. This always puts a big smile on my face. Carnival Night is better, but it's here you'll start to notice that the zones in this title are gonna last a bit longer than the ones in previous games. It's still nothing too egregious. I find that the more times I run through it, the faster I get, which is kind of how Sonic levels tend to work. Once again, it rewards careful platforming to reach higher ground, and I actually do think hopping around on these balloons is kind of fun. It does have some obstacles that really threw some people off. Uh, there's this barrel here that you land on, and you need to press up and down to get it to rise and fall, and with repetition, the distance in both directions will grow. Thing is, it's not good at communicating this, and while I was lucky enough not to have issues with this myself, this thing is infamous for a reason. This really did confuse a lot of people back in the day, and I understand why. And oh, buddy. Then there's Ice Cap Zone. It starts off with Sonic barreling down a hill on a snowboard, and yeah, I know, it's totally outside of your control, it's a glorified cutscene, but I still think the way it's presented keeps that momentum feeling exciting, and there are parts of the action that actually adhere to your inputs. Well, that and the way that the snowball falls on him at the end is a cute touch. Dude, this level just gets better every time I play it, especially Act 2, where I feel like all of my multiple playthroughs pay off because I get better at staying on the optimal routes that keep me blasting through the area faster. There's a certain relationship this kind of level design builds between the game and the player. I think this is showcased in both acts of Ice Cab, most of Marble Garden Zone, and both acts of the final stage in Base Sonic 3, Launch Base Zone. This is the crash site of the Death Egg, and Robotnik has been hard at work getting his behemoth ready to fly again. To stop it, you'll need to reach him at the end of the stage, but you'll notice a lot of places where if you're not paying a whole lot of attention, you'll be looping back around through the same area several times until you start using the tools around you or jumping to the right platforms to make progress. I can see how this would be frustrating to some at times, but again, it builds on that system, rewarding you for doing more than just holding forward and pressing jump a few times. The game is calling on you to become spatially aware and adapt to your surroundings. It's almost like a terrain-based puzzle, one you'll have to solve if you want to keep moving forward, something that Knuckles is once again here to stop you from doing. And man, this guy has shown up a few times to impede your progress, sending you down with the wind currents, turning out the lights, that sort of thing, but now he's taking out an entire building. Bro, he's up. Well, after a quick scuffle with Eggman, we do see Knuckles again, but he's really not able to do much now, and he's caught entirely off guard when the Death Egg starts to relaunch, kind of giving off the impression that he and Eggman haven't really been on the same page here. Hmm. This is where things start to diverge and also where we need to pick up the pace a little bit. If you're playing Sonic 3 just on its own, there are attempts made to make this have a little more finality, but if you attach the Knuckles cartridge to it, this is just the halfway point. In Sonic 3 Standalone, Eggman will pull out his big hunk of metal called the Big Arm to take you on, but this extra boss is absent when playing Sonic 3 and Knuckles. It might be for the best just to keep things moving forward, but it is an auto mission. That said, Angel Island Revisited does give you the option to have this boss battle show up again, and I do recommend that. It's a cool moment and a good fight. Either way, you'll see the Death Egg fail to relaunch, but much of those repairs have still been done, and you need to catch up to the battle station before it can be used again. This thing needs to be gone for good, Clearly incapacitating it is not enough. That's when you descend into Mushroom Hill Zone, which is a lot more tame than Launch Base, but it's worth remembering that if you're playing Sonic and Knuckles here, this would be the first area of that game. And I do love this stage. It's one of my favorites in this double stack title. I especially adore seeing the colors change and fade as you run through it, and man, the music is once again amazing. That's something that stays true for this whole title, and there may be a story behind that. And while Sonic CD's Japanese soundtrack beats this one out for me, it's still one of the best compilations of music you'll hear in this series. Next up is Flying Battery Zone, and I do really like this level, even if there's not a ton to say about it. It does help highlight how good this game is at offering fun new ways to progress through platforming areas, though, and it's got great little speed-oriented segments. I also like that this area has some of the more interesting ways of hiding secrets, like pushing these spikes out of the way. I don't remember how I first discovered this. I think I thought this object placement was just sort of weird and suspicious, and well, I guess that paid off. After this is Sandopolis, which can be a bit much. Act 2 is the biggest offender here. It is cool, and I like the leveling concept. Like, constantly having to keep the lights on so these ghosts don't materialize and kill you is kind of fun and tense, but while I think the length of many of the other zones is justified, here it's just kind of 
Okay, let's wrap this up and get a move on, guys. It's still not the worst, and honestly, I do think Act 1 is fun, but I feel like Act 2 needed to be streamlined to balance the fun ideas with fun gameplay. But man, the area after this? Lava Reef Zone? Brilliant. Kino. Wizard. As the kids would say, this place is so gorgeous, but it elevates the interactive storytelling to a whole new level. Against the beautiful stone background, you'll see the looming face of the Death Egg peering down from the surface, and then finally we see it in action, scorching the caverns around you in a terrifying show of force as magma comes up and threatens you from every corner. Getting to see a glimpse of what this massive machine can do is a treat. We spent so much time trying to stop it from taking off, but what was the real threat here? Now we have some idea of what that is. But that's not the only threat we've encountered in this adventure, as that grouchy Akina has been stopping by to cause us issues every step of the way, but after leaving Lava Reef and entering the Hidden Palace, we can finally face off against this guy, and man, after all that buildup, wouldn't you just know it? This guy can barely defend himself, it's, it's hardly even a fight. From a pure momentary gameplay standpoint, wow, this fight is disappointing, because you don't even have to try here. He just goes down like he's made of paper, but let me tell you why I like it anyway. This man has been showcased as a consistent obstacle throughout your entire time on Angel Island, but there have been times when the game has asked you to question, is he really the bad guy here? The fact that this fight is so underwhelming, the fact that you spent so much time building up a rivalry with Knuckles with a need to get back at him for all the trouble he's caused you, this is like a wordless way of saying he was never really your enemy. But there's something else happening in this encounter, as in the background you can see a mural, something left by the ancient Echidna tribe. The image of a very familiar mustached foe facing off against a blue figure enveloped in a golden glow, a prophecy of a warrior fighting off against a great threat and a tremendous battle to be fought over the Master Emerald, a massive green gem standing tall above the others we become familiar with, lying dormant in a chamber of the Hidden Palace, resting and holding unmatched power, dwarfing that of the Chaos Emeralds, and in the wrong hands could lead to irreparable consequences. I have my suspicions that Knuckles saw this warning and acted on it, but maybe misinterpreted who in this image was on his side. Angel Island, the Master Emeralds, maybe even the Chaos Emeralds, they're all his responsibility and he is their guardian. That's why he's been getting in our way this whole time, because chaos is power, and that power can be dangerous. This brings back an element from Sonic 2 that I wasn't all that thrilled with, but most of my complaints have been taken care of here. This is the redemption of Super Sonic. So goalposts are back, pass them with a certain number of rings, 20, 35, or 50, and you'll enter, well, not a special stage, but they are actually bonus stages. Usually just an easy way to grab some extra rings or power-ups like elemental shields and that sort of thing, but there's no chaos emeralds to be found here. Now, this time around, the entrances to special stages are handled through the giant rings. Just like in Sonic 1 and CD, these will transport you to a special stage where you can try to get your hands on some shiny MacGuffins, but now they're not just waiting at the end of acts and there's no ring requirement to get them to appear. You just have to find them. Hidden in secret pathways, behind rock walls, these are the game's way of constantly rewarding you for your skill die and reflexes, and what's even better, you're usually gonna see several of these in each act of every zone. You could very well collect four out of the seven Chaos Emeralds in Angel Island Zone. You could have Supersonic as soon as Zone 3, and if you've taken the time to learn where these things are and how to access them quickly, I don't think it even hinders the pacing of traveling through these levels themselves. In fact, I actually think it helps. As these levels are longer than the ones in previous games, I actually think it's great that these special stages can can break up the length a little bit. Of course, it's not enough to just access the special stages, you have to complete them too. Welcome to the Blue Sphere minigame. You'll be placed on this revolving plane littered with blue and red spheres. Your goal is to run through all of the blue spheres while avoiding the red ones as making contact with one of those will automatically end the stage. But if you see a cluster of blue spheres grouped together, you'll want to run through all of the ones on the outside wall. While touching the blue boys usually turns them into red ones, collecting all of the outer balls in a surrounding group will turn them and the the spheres that they were enveloping into rings. There's a set number of rings in these stages too, including the ones you can get from chaining groups, and by collecting all the rings in a special stage before collecting all the blue spheres, you'll get a perfect bonus which will award you with an extra life as well as a huge point bonus, and of course, collect all the blue spheres to nab yourself a Chaos Emerald. 
I have a ton of fun with these special stages. They're each designed like puzzles where you gotta figure out the best path to collect all the blue spheres, avoid all the red ones, and nab that perfect ring bonus if you're feeling spicy. I would rate these just below the special stages from Sonic CD. I like those ones just a little bit more, but I do get a kick out of these, and nothing beats the adrenaline rush that comes from the tougher ones, especially since you'll start moving faster automatically the further you progress through them. Once you've collected the seven Chaos Emeralds, it's Super Sonic time, and oh man, does it feel better than before. Once you've gotten accustomed to this game and what it demands from you, it's so satisfying being able to just jet through these areas like a speeding bullet. And I think they may have tweaked the control a bit too, cause I don't have as many issues with platforming as Super Sonic this time around either. That said, the music is just a constant loop of the short invincibility theme, and I highly, highly recommend using the unused supersonic theme if you're playing this through Angel Island Revisited. It's just such a good track, it's almost criminal that it wasn't in the official release. Of course, you can blast through Sonic 3 or Sonic & Knuckles as standalone games and beat them as Supersonic, but what about in that combined adventure? Sure, you actually can zip through the second half of 3 and K as Supersonic, but what if I told you there was another secret up this game's sleeve? Only when these games are combined into one journey will you see this, but when playing as Sonic, entering Mushroom Hill Zone after completing Launch Base, you'll be greeted with a new scene of Knuckles leaving... somewhere. He doesn't seem to notice you though, and if you sneak into where you saw him, you'll encounter another giant ring, but this one is different. Glowing in a variety of colors and by jumping inside, this time you're not taken to a special stage, now you're in the chamber of the Master Emerald, that sacred place hiding the massive green jewel that is under the protection of our little echidna buddy. The Chaos Emeralds are placed on the surrounding pedestals. They don't belong wandering out in the wilderness, they belong right here with the Master Emerald. But by jumping on top of one of these pedestals, you'll be taken to another special stage. It's the same format as the ones before, but they are getting a little trickier now. This one is my least favorite. Your reward for completing these is not a new jewel, but rather the perfection of an old one. This is how you bring clarity to the fearsome power of the chaos and obtain the super emeralds. Once again, tracking down the giant rings is a good time, but if you really know what you're doing, you can collect the remaining six in the two acts that make up Mushroom Hill Zone. I mean, you won't on your first playthrough, I'm telling you that right now, but it is possible, and many of these zones have fun ways of providing these special stages to you. I point you once again to Flying Battery and Sandopolis. It's one of those things where I think the giant ring hunt actually makes some of these stages a bit more engaging. But once you've gathered all of them and mastered control over these ancient artifacts, a new power is offered to you. Hypersonic. Even faster, even more powerful, a second press of the jump button will just decimate anything around you and hurl you forward, you've got an after image everywhere you go, sparks of raw energy erupt from your body, the colors of the emeralds radiate from your presence, this is the true power of a group of MacGuffins that we've been collecting since game one. Now there are two great features that Sonic 3 Air adds to the super and hypersonic experience, uh, the music being one of them like I mentioned before, but I do have notes on one of the others. This version of the game gives you the ability to turn the super and hyper forms off and on at will. This kind of takes away from the consequences of the form, like being able to turn it off during slow sections and just throw it back on for the more hectic ones kind of defeats the purpose a bit. I mean, finding 50 rings should just be the start. You also have to choose the best time to use your new power because once you activate it, you're locked in. You're invincible, yes, but every second that passes, you're losing one of your rings and once those are gone, so is your super form, and you might just be leaving yourself more vulnerable later on, so there actually is some small level of strategy to account for here. It makes things easier, yeah, but there's a limit to it, and given that this form is derived from an energy source literally named after chaos itself, it makes sense that this would be a difficult power to control, but I feel like the hyper form should be on the other side of that coin. You've hunted down the method to bring an order to this chaos, to develop an understanding of this energy and quell the turmoil lying within its catalysts. So the idea 
that the Super Emeralds would grant you more control over these abilities makes perfect sense to me, and making it so that you could turn Hyperform on and off as you please, but locking you into a Super Form would be a perfect way to communicate this difference. But we're also talking about a feature that only exists in a fam ROM hack. I think the way that it works in the vanilla game is just fine. The idea brought forth in Sonic Air is just really interesting to me, that's all. All of this is to emphasize what a journey the Emeralds take you on in this game, and it was all foretold by the Echidnas long ago, your tail etched in stone years before you reached this island. And Knuckles here was just trying to protect these gems from what he might have interpreted from the mural as an oncoming threat that needed to be vanquished. But he was clearly wrong, and after you fight with the guardian of these relics, we see Eggman flying in to claim his prize during the commotion, taking off with the Master Emerald. Knuckles tries to stop him, but you can only watch as the Doctor attacks the Red Warrior and leaves you all behind. There's a good moment here where you can see Knuckles processing everything that just happened. He made mistakes up to this point, trying to protect his home against the wrong people while unknowingly aiding his enemy, but it only takes him a couple of seconds to put the pieces together, and then he waves over Sonic and Tails, leading them to a teleporter. Knuckles leads them outside to one of the final areas, Sky Sanctuary. By all accounts, this should be a peaceful and majestic place, but it only takes a few moments to see the looming face of the Death Egg rising from the clouds in the background, creeping out over the scenery as it starts to launch several objects towards the island. Knuckles is tuckered out. He doesn't have much energy left to give, but he does just enough to extend a bridge out to our heroes, and actually, there's a secret animation you can trigger here by standing in a really specific spot and pressing down. Do that, and Knuckles will start waving you along, kind of like saying, go on without me. I'll be all right. The rest is up to you. The rest of the level is just trying to reach the death egg. There's no normal enemies. You can see that the small animals here haven't been assimilated by Robotnik yet, but they're sent cowering in fear as these large sentry robots begin invading the place. While you speed through this crumbling paradise, the music swells into this epic tune, encapsulating the stakes and tension of this moment, letting you know that you're close to the finish. And along the way, you run into a brand new, decked out Mechasonic Mark II. He starts coming at you, mimicking Eggman bosses from Sonic 1 and 2, and a cute touch Sonic 3 Air introduces is the ability to have the game play those respective boss themes during these fights as well. But it caps off with a one-on-one -on -one duel with this guy. It's not really difficult, but spreading the fight out like this still makes the overall encounter a treat. But there's no time to waste as the Death Egg almost completes its launch, and Sonic and Tails hop on for the final showdown. I have come to like this area a bit more over the years, but I do kind of wish it was one act, kind of like Sky Sanctuary. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand the appeal. The Death Egg has been this huge, present threat throughout several of the games up to this point, and we haven't gotten to see a whole lot of the actual base itself. So it's cool getting to run through here, but I also think the overall tension would have been better served if it was just one straight shot, single act course. I do think some gimmicks here are a little needless. This weird energy tunnel feels like kind of a waste of time. I, I don't get this. But there's positive years too, like the electrical floor is not doing damage to you if you have the electrical shield. It's one of the small ways of making the elemental shields a relevant mechanic all the way through to the end, and I think the gravity shifting is a fun idea too. Though I do know it's not everybody's favorite thing in the world. The initial boss fight at the end though, I could honestly do without. It's interesting putting together that you have to manipulate gravity to send the robot's traps flying back into his weak spot, but once you figured it out, it takes way too long to actually wrap it up, and it ends up overstaying its welcome with not much challenge to compensate for it. But everything after this? You've got no idea. You try to go after Robotnik, but he's quick to jump into one of his new machines, and this one was foreshadowed back in Lava Reef. You have to carefully take out each of the fingers on his hands before they crush you, and once that's over, he changes positions and starts chasing you down this runway. And you have to get him to drop his guard over his chest and reveal the Master Emerald powering the dang thing, which he can also use to fire a laser at you. It makes for a good, intimidating two-phase fight against the giant Eggman Robo, and if you fail here, there's nowhere to pick up extra rings, adding to how tense this encounter is and really forcing you to take your time and practice caution. Then Eggman makes a break for it in his Eggmobile, trying to hold on to the Master Emerald as you chase him through his massive structure as it falls apart around you. And if you get this far without going for the Emeralds, the game ends here, but if you have Super or Hypersonic available to you, you have the power to keep pursuing him as he makes it into yet another vessel, and now you have to collect as many rings as you can, because if they run out and you lose this form, you'll find yourself plummeting down to the planet below. Make it to his ship and 
and guide his own missiles to fly directly into his cockpit. You're the most powerful you've ever been, and nothing can hurt you, but you still have to be on top of your game because time is of the essence and you can't hold on to this form forever. Deal enough damage and Eggman is down to his last resort. One final robot that can't even fight you. All it can do is flee, but you're fast enough to catch up to it and finally take back the powerful jewel from his possession. This is such an incredible finale. There is an energy here, man. Even if I'm not crazy about the way it starts, how many games have final bosses that just keep going, keep upping the ante, continuing to build on themselves like this? It's a desperate struggle between two lifelong foes, dueling over one of the most incredible sources of power either of them will ever encounter. Robotnik has learned how dangerous Sonic is in their previous battles, and he's bringing in measures for every possibility, making every possible effort he can to outrun this hedgehog and claim his prize, and Sonic is holding nothing back as he just goes full throttle. He knows he can't afford to let Eggman get away with this thing, or he could become unstoppable. This is one of my favorite finales to a game, hands down. It's made all the more special to me because you have to put in the effort to even see half of this battle. That encounter has to be earned, and as Sonic descends with the Master Emerald, teaming up with Tails to return this artifact to its natural resting place, I am exhausted, and I am thrilled, and I am satisfied in what an incredible journey this has been. This was the most massive a Sonic game had been up to this point. There are games in the series coming out today that still fail to reach the scale and scope of what was being attempted here, and I am amazed by how well realized it was on the Genesis. And the most insane part? There's more. Obviously, you get to play as Tails in this title, just like you could in Sonic 2, but when Sonic & Knuckles was released, you could also, as you might imagine, play as Sonic's red echidna rival, and combining the two games together lets you run through the entire journey as this guy. But they didn't just stop with a reskin. Now Tails is capable of flying and swimming for a limited period of time, and Knuckles can glide, climb, and punch his way through barriers other characters can't pass. This allows each of these characters to explore Angel Island in completely unique ways, and there's little areas and sections only they can access. Tails goes through a very similar adventure to Sonic. You know, same levels, same bosses, and same overall structure, but it's great being able to play as him and his new unique abilities make this almost the easy mode. Well, with the exception of a boss fight that ends up being harder than it needs to be because you're on your own now instead of playing as a duo, but then there's Knuckles. This is where you get a better idea of this guy's deal and experience the story from his perspective. This guy has entire sections for several zones that other characters will never see. Pathways totally totally inaccessible to anyone else, and the major events all have a new spin, like he's letting himself into an area instead of being the one sending someone down there. Or, how you don't see Eggman here, you actually just see this robot posing as him and replacing Robotnik during boss fights. Well, except the one in Flying Battery Act 2, because I guess they kind of forgot to switch that sprite, but Sonic 3 Air does fix that little oversight. The coolest part to me, though, is the ending, where Knuckles experiences this completely differently. There's no Death Egg Zone at all. Once you make it to Hidden Palace, Knuckles teleports himself to Sky Sanctuary, and it seems like at first he's gonna be getting a final match against this robot that's been giving him issues all game long, but then Mecha Sonic Mark II blasts in, stealing the stage as your final boss. He's actually pretty easy at first, but he really turns the tables when he reveals that he can harness energy from the Master Emeralds, and well, he's still not that hard to beat, but man, it's so cool that they went out of their way to give Knuckles his own final fight here. It really helps make this feel like his journey, and if you really want a bit more from him, you could even combine your Sonic and Knuckles cartridge with a copy of Sonic 2, and there you go. Knuckles the Echidna in Sonic the Hedgehog 2, complete with his own abilities and secrets to uncover. One of the best aspects of these extra characters, though, is that with Tails and Knuckles being able to explore in their own ways, they're able to also find their own giant rings and enter special stages. Kind of like in Sonic 2, collecting the seven Chaos Emeralds will not grant Tails a super form, you just kind of have a mutant fox with fancy jewelry, though Sonic 3 Air does amend this. But Knuckles does get his own super form, and activating it makes this guy go feral. I mean, just look at those teeth. But if you go the extra mile, both Tails and Knuckles do get their new forms from the Super Emeralds, Hyper Knuckles and Super Tails. Hyper Knuckles is just a beast, blasting through everything, creating shockwaves when he lands on walls, and Super Tails brings friends, an army of rabid flickies who fly in and attack everything that moves. It's a sight to behold, though it doesn't seem like these forms add anything to the endings like they do for Sonic. Still, the absolute amount of content here is ridiculous. If you had to buy two cartridges to get the full experience, you were going to get the 
full experience with as much as the developers could possibly fit into those ROMs. That's why this video is so obnoxiously long. I couldn't leave any stone unturned, I couldn't take any easy routes or leave out any details that popped into my head. I needed to make this my own personal ultimate analysis of Sonic 3 Knuckles, and if you couldn't already tell what I think of this title, it's amazing. Ambitious, unrelenting, massive, and fun. Sonic 3 Knuckles holds nothing back. This is not just another Sonic game. This is more than a simple Sonic story. This is a Sonic adventure, and it's one that I don't think I can ever forget. Obviously, there were some dips. I mean, when aren't there? And I'm frustrated by some aspects of how Sonic Origins is being handled, but I can't deny that I'm just excited that, yeah, this game is about to see a level of official availability it hasn't had in over a decade. The more people that can play this, the better. It's one of the best games in the Sonic series. Hell, it's one of the best titles from the 16-bit era. From its wonderfully crafted environments to its memorable story beats, its legally troublesome music, and the legacy that it left for the series, laying down a goal for future titles to reach. I love this game. I don't know if there's really much more I can say about it. I've tried to convey the level of respect I have for the sheer passion in this title. I suppose all I can say now is that it's time to go and make your own memories with it. I know I said Sonic CD might have taken over as my favorite game in the classic series, but after revisiting this, Nah, the double-decker monstrosity still takes the cake. By all means, through whatever method you see fit, please play Sonic 3 and Knuckles. So this video got out of hand, but I just really couldn't help myself. This is one of the biggest deals in the Sonic series, and it's effectively the end of the classic era, depending on how you want to look at it and I knew I just needed to do it justice. I mean, of course it doesn't end here. Sonic went on to have so many big adventures, and the next major title in the series is one of the first video games I ever played, if not the first. So that means we're gonna have to look at Sonic Adventure at some point. Maybe a 10,000 subscriber special? I'm, I'm not sure yet, but whenever we do get to it, we're gonna make an event out of it. As for what comes next, I am going to be stepping away from Sonic content, at least for a little bit. Uh, smaller stuff like 3D Blast, Mean Bean Machine, that might be in the cards, but uh, something like Sonic Adventure is a huge project and I gotta tackle that when I'm ready for it again. Maybe a 10k subscriber special, we'll, we'll see. If that's what you want, go ahead and start spreading the word, let's see if we can crank those numbers up. In the meantime, I am going to be at Too Many Games next month. I believe it's up in uh, Pennsylvania. I'll be over there with some friends, including Nick and Cirrus from Sunset City. Sadly, Pup couldn't make it, but we will get him over here eventually. But yeah, if you see me there and you just want to swing by and say hi, it'd be cool to see some people uh, that have been following the channel, so that'd be fun. And uh, another thing I know for sure is this is the last review that I'm working on in this office, or in this house. Uh, my roommates and I have gotten a new place, and we're going to be moving on over there pretty soon. Uh, once I'm done with the editing process of this video, I'm going to start pulling out some boxes, throwing some stuff together, and uh, getting ready for the move. I am excited about it, we're looking forward to this, uh, but I am a little emotional, just because I've grown a lot over the past couple of years, just as a person, and on this channel, and a lot of the content that I've worked on that I attribute to that was right here in this room. So, it is a little weird to be moving on from this. Uh, I am sure that you guys understand it is going to take me a little time to get settled in the new place. Uh, once we're all set up and I've got everything situated over there, I can start working again on, on videos and I already have plenty of ideas for what's coming next. Um, but we will have to get there when we get there. Until then, remember that my top tier patrons get to see these videos two days early. You can find me on Twitter, Twitch, Discord, Sunset City, whichever you prefer. Links in the description, and of course, as always, spread the word, tell your friends, and until we see each other again, thank you so much for watching. See you next mission.
that was a long video. Uh, thank you guys so much for making this sort of thing possible. Uh, I've said it before, I would not be able to justify the amount of time and effort that goes into something like this if it wasn't for your support. Uh, obviously, you know, the smaller, uh, sometimes a lot of the, the more negative reviews are fun to put together and they're fun to, fun to watch, you know, they can be kind of humorous in their own right. But it's these little passion projects where I can just gush and I can just go crazy over telling you why I adore something and everything that I think makes it good. This matters to me and you guys supporting me being able to do something like this means the world. And that also goes for just like, you know, everybody that likes these uh, these videos, that shares them around, the people that comment, and when I talk to people and they're just, you know, I saw this video and I liked it. You, you have no idea how much it, it helps build my drive to keep putting stuff like this together. And of course, it is also helpful that I do have my wonderful Patreon supporters. Whether you're one of the top tier patrons or you're donating a dollar a month, every bit helps. You guys are keeping this going, and I am I am always just more pumped all the time to just keep on moving forward and to keep growing this channel, to keep doing stuff like this, and it is all because of you guys. Thank you so much. And of course, I do have to give a very special shout out to my current top tier patrons. This month, they are Brendan Hess, Christine Larkin, Earl Valco, Jeremiah Harrison, Lederick, Mackenzel, Mr. SP, Wanton Photo, Nicole Plated, Patricia Marcou, Cinderin7, and Cirrus the Skeptic. Uh, Nicole, you are a new patron. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, I am sorry if I mispronounced your name. Nicole uh, Plated, Nicole Plated. I'm not entirely sure. If you need to correct me, uh, please do. Um, I, I won't take offense to it when I'm reading off everybody's names here. I just want to make sure I'm doing it correctly. Uh, so I, I just want to go ahead and throw that out there. But thank you guys so, so much. You do make this possible. You make it worth it. And I am so happy to be here doing this with you guys supporting me along the way. With all of that said, uh, I do have another video that has been kind of on the back burner for a very long time. And I think it's finally time to get this monstrosity out there. It's going to be a much more in-depth and a much more technical review than I'm used to doing in the past and it's been one of the more interesting scripts to put together so I will uh, I will join you guys next time hopefully sometime soon with that video do I need to take a break before then I'm not entirely sure I, I do at least need a good sandwich or something so with that said thanks again so much for watching and I'll see you next mission <laughs>